they're happening. Okay, so every presentation needs to start with a disclaimer. So here's my disclaimer. I need you to read it and agree to it. <laughs> and there's my real disclaimer. The most important part is the last line. So a little bit about myself. I've been in the information security field since 1999. Uh, until about a year and a half ago, I had a string of chief information security officer roles. Prior to that, my uh, roles within the field were very technical. Presented a number of conferences. I have some degrees and certifications. Currently, in the last few months, by day, I work as an architect at a Fortune 200 company. And by night, I work as a researcher through my company, Health and Brain. Also, a little bit more about me. I'm fascinated about LinkedIn and its endorsements. <laughs> so, this is a colleague of mine, and I woke up one morning to see that he endorsed me for all these various skills. <laughs> Very few of which I actually have, and a few of which I don't even know what they are. How is that basalt? Basalt's uh, good, yeah. I do do basalt. <laughs> Not the last week, though. So, uh, obviously, I accepted all these, and they now serve my profile. So uh, for those that don't know me, I'm a big fan of craft beer. I consume it quite a bit. I also haven't signed my own signature on anything in about three years. So when I sign a credit card slip, I'll do cross-site scripting, I'll draw pictures. Uh, my wife happens to be over there. One time she told me, uh, please sign it normal. So I wrote normal wife's request. <laughs> they were very explicit instructions. I also had a tweet that got a lot of publicity on Twitter, so I just threw it into here so you can take a look at it. Alright, so in terms of ground rules for today, we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments, so feel free to jump in, and I also should have some time at the end for that. I'll also be available after the talk, uh, throughout the week, if anyone wants to discuss. So please jump in and ask any questions that you have. All right, so let's back up to about a year ago. I just want to tell a little story. So a year and two days ago, I resigned from my position um, as a Chief Information Security Officer and decided to work for myself. The very next day, I came to DEF CON. And when I got back, I didn't really have much to do. I hadn't lined up any consulting work, so I spent a lot of time in the pool working out and drinking beer. And so while I was sitting at the pool, uh, one of the things that I thought about, well, I thought a lot about passwords and actually did a lot of research with password cracking and using Amazon's EC2 cloud service to do some interesting things. I haven't touched that in the last few months, and then I moved on to uh, wearing my chief information security officer hat and said, no, I don't know a whole lot about password policies on the various websites that people interact with. Let me see if anyone's done any research. And I really couldn't find any good research on password policies and other account access controls for the most popular website. So I decided, let me give that a try. So late last year, I started on that. And long story short, I was supposed to present an RSA on this topic, but my data ended up being a whole lot worse than I thought it was. And I didn't have time to address that. So I pulled out, here I am today. So I'm sitting at the pool asking myself two questions. Are sites doing a good job in protecting users' accounts via passwords, authentication, and other controls? And how much control do security conscious users have? In other words, if they were security conscious and they were using a particular site and they wanted to use long passwords or complex passwords or do things to make the access to their accounts uh, secure, would they have the ability to do that? So from there, I looked at what sites I should inspect. I mean, there's the obvious ones from Facebooks and Googles that everybody has accounts on and, and are widely used. And I asked myself, what type of data should be collected, and how should I go about gathering the data? So one of the first things I did was I wanted to find out what the most popular sites are, and I've been using this site, Alexa, for quite a while. The way Alexa works is they have a toolbar I don't know anybody actually uses it. Does anyone actually have an Alexa toolbar installed on their computer? Okay, apparently millions of people do. I have <laughs> um, The data may be a little bit skewed, but Amazon bought Alexa some number of years back. And what they do with the data is they track the websites that people visit, and they rank them. And they do that by looking at a three-month average of data on two criteria. One, daily unique visitors and page views. They don't disclose 
how those two are combined, we come up with the rankings. But for my purpose is, it wasn't really important to know whether a website was ranked 900th or 1,503rd. I was just looking for a large number of websites that people go to. So the exact rankings and how accurate they are didn't really matter to me too much. So in the past, the way I've gone about utilizing this information is I've gone directly to Alexa website. You can go and look at their top 500, which there's a couple ways to do it. They have an international list and list by countries. So I typically would look at the US list. You can also download on a daily basis. They have an update of the top million international websites. And so I started to use that file. And just to give an example of the contents of that file, here are those first 50 records in the 10,000th record. Because I just decided 10,000 was a good round number and that was the number of websites I wanted to look at. And one of the things that became pretty apparent to me pretty quickly was it looked like there were some websites that were not going to be in English. Um, there were also some porn websites, which, hey, people visit porn websites, so might as well look at those too. Um, <laughs> And interestingly, I had some volunteers that gave me feedback like, um, I'm not going to look at that website because I don't look at websites like that, or send me more like that. So, <laughs> really, <laughs> also, I had one person tell me that he had clear as cash and promised his wife that he would look at websites like that again. So, <laughs> I'm sure he's taking the appropriate measures. So, then I decided I wanted to look at the top 10,000 websites in the US, and that's much harder to come by. There is not a free version of that. So, uh, Fortunately, uh, there is a paid version, and so it's called Alexa Top Sites, and it costs a fraction of a penny per each site that you request via their API. It works out to $2.50 per 1,000 URLs. I needed 10,000, so that was going to cost me $25. I already had an Amazon Web Services account. You need that. You need to click a button saying, I want to sign up for uh, Alexa Top Sites. Pretty trivial. There are a couple of keys that are generated. Um, and then there's a sample code that's available in these four languages that are listed. I've been working with uh, Perl since 1998, PhD since the year after that. Little job experience, and I've tried to start learning Ruby, but I'm not very good at it. So to punish myself, I decided to go with PhD. I also know there's a lot of people in the security field that hate PhD, so I thought that was an even better reason for choosing it. Uh, I do a lot of scripting and bash. So I just wanted to give you an example of what I did to retrieve the 10,000 records. Because the API calls, you can only request 100 records at a time. So I took a PHP script that was available on the Amazon website, modified it to meet my needs, wrapped it in a bash script, and ran it. Unfortunately, the first time I ran it, I looked at my results and just did a WC-L account the number of lines, and it was something like 400. So I was a little bit concerned because I thought I requested 10,000 records. It turns out I did, but um, due to a flaw in my code based on early testing, I only saved 5% or whatever that works out to be. I only saved 400 records, so I paid $25 for 10,000 records, and I actually made the calls for that, but I didn't save the data, so I had to run it a second time. So now I have the data. <laughs> So when I looked at the websites this time, only looking at the, and these are not US-based websites, these are websites based on individuals running the Alexa toolbar that are geographically located in the United States. So there still will be websites outside the United States within the top 10,000, but there are a whole lot less non-English language sites and websites that, at least in the top 50, I was uh, unfamiliar with. So it's not that I wanted to ignore websites that non-US users tend to look at. It's just in terms of limiting the scope for this particular part of the research, I had to start somewhere. So I started with what I knew and what the people that I'd be working with would be able to um, access. So you can see, uh, I'm told sites 44 and 45 are porn sites, and there's probably a few more in there. Um, that's just what I've been told. I kind of validated that. <laughs> So I was sitting in the pool and I started asking myself, what attributes could I collect? And this is just a partial list. Um, I actually came up with more than 100 attributes that I could potentially look at, but I didn't really want to find out more than I could chew. So I started looking at the basics, like minimum and maximum password length. Then I got a little bit more technical and I was wondering, 
what sites did to protect the session cookies? Was it possible to intercept those in plain text uh, over a non-SSL connection? Were they constructed in a random way, or were they trivial to brute force or a guess? And I looked at other controls besides what happens when you log in, such as if I did a brute force attack against the authentication system, would that be detected? And are there things like captchas that are put in place to make it a little bit more difficult to perform a brute force attack? I'm not going to walk through all these. Uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that I looked at. <coughs> so I have this tendency to build long lists and then want to look at everything and then have to take a step back and realize if I did that, it would just be too time consuming and it would be information overload. So what I did was I identified 20 attributes to start with and I said to myself, these might not be the right 20 attributes to look at, but let's start with these and start visiting some websites and collecting information <coughs> pertaining to these attributes and see if these attributes make sense and if the way that I wanted to record the data made sense. So for example, one of the things I was initially looking at was maximum password length and I realized that it was not quite that simple. Um, in some cases, websites did have maximum password lengths listed. Other cases, they did not. In some cases, they didn't tell you until you entered a password it was too long. In other cases, there were HTML max length attributes that restricted the maximum length to a certain value. Even though if you bypass that, you could create longer passwords. Uh, there were any slew of things related to maximum passwords or minimum passwords. So I started to make more granular lists of the types of attributes and what the relationships were. I also started to notice some unusual behavior, such as some websites automatically, without any user inter interaction, would email me my password in plain text. <laughs> so I decided that might be an interesting piece of information to capture. I also started to make assumptions later on in my analysis that if a website did that, it was most likely that the password was being stored in plain text. It's possible it's being stored in some other format or encrypted, but um, in my experience, it's very unlikely that a website that sends somebody a plain text password would go to great lengths to encrypt the passwords or do something to obfuscate them, and then reverse that to send the user the password they didn't ask for. I also noticed patterns. For example, a lot of non-English websites Websites, they were in the top 10,000, but they didn't have user accounts. Uh, you can still use the website, but there was no login capability. There are websites like bank account websites that you could log in, but to create an account, uh, you couldn't actually create the account via the website directly. So as I moved forward in my research and thought about how best to capture this, I started to predefine values for the attributes that I might potentially want to look at. And then I, I noticed that there was a way I could look at the chaos and sort of organize the attributes into various categories. And these are not a complete list of the attributes I looked at, but the important piece here on this slide are the categorizations that I established. There are a lot of attributes that really had to do with password strength. So I include their user education. To me, that affects the password strength. Um, well, that's a hypothesis of mine. Hypothesis of mine. I haven't actually concluded that that's actually accurate, but my hypothesis is if you tell users how to create a strong password, it may be more likely that they will create a strong password. Then I looked at other controls related to unauthorized access prevention and detection, uh, such as two-factor authentication, whether the user after they logged in was presented with information about the last login details or active file logins. So, uh, websites like Facebook do that, though it's not easy to find. You actually have to know where to dig to find it. Um, other websites do that too, immediately after you log in. So if you see that somebody logged in from an IP address or geographic location that you, do, you don't utilize, that may be something that tips you off that somebody has compromised your account. Look at security questions. Uh, a category I call authentication bypass is things that could be leveraged, vulnerabilities that could be leveraged to gain access to an account. So for example, if session cookies can be intercepted or it's possible to perform a cross-site scripting um, exploit to retrieve a cookie that has a session ID, it may be possible to masquerade as an individual even though the password is strong and all the other controls are adequate. Uh, in terms of password storage, there's not really much I can do there except 
make assumptions based on whether plain text passwords are displayed or sent to me, or whether there have been previous breaches where it's been disclosed that plain text passwords have been sent, or specific caching algorithms have been used. And there's also information out about breaches these websites experience or their vulnerability history. So my, my uh, hypothesis is if a website has had a large number of vulnerabilities that they are slow about fixing or do not have a good relationship with security researchers who disclose vulnerabilities to them, it may be likely, more likely than not that their password and authentication controls are poorer than websites that do have good relationships with security researchers. So based on this and what I did myself, I determined an efficient workflow for collecting the data. So if I wanted to do something like determine the minimum and maximum password length, if the site told me the minimum was eight and the maximum was 15, I could assume that that was probably true, and I could note that. Uh, if it didn't tell me or it only told me the minimum, I might have to create multiple accounts and try multiple different types of passwords to make a true determination. You can't always trust information that the website discloses. I believe I have a slide later on. FedEx.com tells users that they can create a six character password, but they try to create anything less than eight, it won't let them do that. So a lot of websites have inconsistencies not just on a particular part of the website, but between different parts. So they may have one set of controls in place for creating a new password, another set of controls for modifying your password, a completely different set of controls if you forget your password and have one sent to you and then you need to change it. So uh, if I want to look at all those things, it'd be rather quite complex. So what I decided to do was start somewhere smaller, but still look at a comprehensive list of controls and go from there and then broaden later on. So I did this and I started timing how long it took me to do certain sort of things. So one of the first things I had to do is determine whether there was a way to create an account. That took an average of about 20 seconds to do. On some sites it's easy to find, on other sites it takes a little bit more work. And then if I wanted to look at the dozens upon dozens of attributes that I really wanted to collect, it took me two to eight minutes on average to collect that information uh, for an average of four. And if I reduced it down to what I thought were the most important attributes to start with that were also fairly easy to collect, it was an average of two minutes. And then based on my early research, 70% of sites were in scope. If I, in scope, I mean there was a way to create an account. Um, it didn't cost money to create an account, like Netflix or some other sites where you need to a credit card or actually pay money. So I did some math, and my math told me it would take me 17 hours to do right the 10,000 websites just to find out if they have an account creation capability, and it would take me 234 more hours to actually do the data collection for 251 hours total. I have a day job, and I try to have good work-life balance, so I thought I might be able to allocate about two hours a day, so it would take 126 days, and I didn't really feel like spending two hours a day for four months straight, so I looked at what other options were available. Also, there were some things that I was looking at that were semi-automated, like brute force attacking. With the brute force attacking, I still needed to know some things about the uh, HTTP get and post variables, uh, URL, URL destination and cookies. So it, I couldn't do it with a completely automated. It may, it may be possible to do that, but I hadn't gotten that point. So there was still some manual work. And then I have some scripts where I can do the brute force attacking. So it's pretty easy once I have it in place. And then I'm looking for things like, if I enumerate a bunch of passwords, I can save or inspect part of the page that, that is uh, returned and look for things that are different. So typically, a web page, if it's a, if it's a successful login, has some different text than if it's a failed login, or if the account has been logged or some other actions been taken because the brute force attack has been detected. So obviously, this is going to be slow and hard for me to do. So I started thinking about a better way to do it. And one option which I chose not to even pursue at this stage was to ask the sites for data. Uh, the reason I didn't even choose to do that at this point is, as a security researcher, I've discovered numerous vulnerabilities in websites and have had mixed experiences with responsibly disclosing those vulnerabilities. So I'm a little bit jaded, and I don't have a good, strong feeling that if I spent my time contacting these websites, they would return data to me that they would consider potentially revealing security weaknesses in the websites. 
even though most of what I would be asking them would be information that would be easily retrievable with just taking time to get. So I can blackmail people and force them to collect the data. Do you think I did that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, sounds like All right, I'm not going to answer that question. So I can hire a part-time worker, but we're talking probably $10, $15 an hour to do it, and that would really add up. Partners with something I pursued, I had some people that were interested in this project and helped me collect the data. But the most interesting option that I decided to pursue, and this is not a uh, completely extensive list, there are probably some other options, and if any of you know of any, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say, was crowdsourcing, and I decided to pursue that in two different ways, paid and unpaid. And by crowdsourcing, I just essentially mean looking at the large number of people that are available in the world and finding some subset of those people who are interested in doing some work for me for money or doing the work for me for more altruistic purposes. So before I decided to pursue that, I decided to break the data down. And I broke the data down into six fairly arbitrary blocks, 1 to 100, in terms of the ranking of the websites in Alexa. You, you can see the rest of the blocks there. Then, then I tiered those websites with the position that uh, it would be more interesting and useful to spend more time focusing on the top 100 websites and less interesting and less useful to spend time focusing on the bottom 5,000 websites in the top 10,000. So the number of attributes I looked at based on those tiers were 18, 22, and 65. Um, and I randomized the data within those blocks using this function here. Uh, there may be a better function to use, but in this case, I was not trying to do something cryptologically secure. I just didn't want the data to be in a completely sequential sorted list. I wanted it to be fairly randomized so that I could take the first 10 records within a block or first 20 records within a block, assign it to person one, and assign the, uh, the next in the sequence to person two, and not have to worry really whether person one or person two didn't return the data to me because I had a way to accommodate for that. So one thing, and I actually didn't do this piece until um, last week, was I utilized social media to solicit some contributors. And I said, all you're going to get out of this, you're not, you're not getting paid. Uh, all you're going to get is some karma and you'll get some recognition in my presentation or research. So I had a few dozen people respond to me, and I got the, the highest level response via Twitter. Uh, and I don't know if that has to do with the number of followers I have. I probably have twice as many followers on Twitter as people in my LinkedIn and Facebook uh, networks combined. But I got 20, 30 people on Twitter that were interested in getting more information, and I sent them some data. A lot of people responded. Some of them did a whole bunch of work, and some of them, some of them did less. I had three people on Facebook who responded. And some of these people were in information security and some of them were not. LinkedIn, uh, I waited until a couple of days before this presentation just to give that a try and I didn't have any luck with that. So draw your own conclusions. And Google Plus, I just didn't even bother even though I had an account. And I had no family member to help me. Actually two, but one of my family members also worked with me so I didn't count her. So then at that point, I decided to divide the data up into blocks um, of 20 sites at a time. And I just took the simplistic approach of creating spreadsheets, and I just distributed these spreadsheets to my unpaid <laughs> workers. And because I was interested in seeing whether the data was good or not, one of the things I did was one out of every 20 records was the same site as was assigned to somebody else, the other 19 were unique. And then each person that I shared the data with got one to end spreadsheets. And I just want to show you what the spreadsheets look like. It's not really important to focus too much on the data, but in terms of layout, I had a question. Then the answer format was the list of values they could select between. In the field where the website was actually listed was typically a drop down box to reduce error. Uh, I didn't really want users to be manually typing their answers. I didn't want answers that might be worded differently for different people. I did have a, a few issues that came up with that. So with these users, primarily, uh, I asked them, were you able to create an account? If not, why? What was the minimum password for that? Then I made some recommendations about how they went about their testing. The first thing I wanted to do was test the passwords of the, the, the number one. It actually worked in a lot of cases. Then I wanted them to try a 25-character password, and I thought the best way to do that would be start with nominal numeric, because if it worked, 
that pretty much told the person collecting the data that there was probably not a composition requirement. In other words, there was probably not a requirement to use some combination of uppercase, lowercase, special characters and numbers, though there are some exceptions to that. And so that's the process that users went through. And then I asked them questions like, when is the minimum password length displayed? And I was very interested in that because I tried to put myself in the position of somebody using one of these websites. And I felt like if you came to a website and you didn't really know what was expected of you in terms of creating your password, if you weren't guided in terms of creating a strong one or given any constraints until after you created the password, one, you're probably going to be pretty pissed off because you may have spent some time to create one that it wouldn't accept. Um, two, you may also have created one much more weak than what you could have possibly created. So look at that for the minimum maximum password and the composition. Ask uh, whether the page educated the user on how to create a strong password. You can see some of this is, is fairly qualitative. So the responses I got, I can't assume that they're 100% accurate. If I had two or more people answering the same questions for a specific site, two people, two people may have answered it differently, and that's okay. Does the page discourage me from not using the same password I use anywhere? We'll see the answer to that later, but uh, percentage-wise, does anyone want to take a guess on the percentage of websites that actually discourage a user from using the same password they use somewhere else? One? One. Zero? Zero. Zero? So a really low number. Okay, we'll see if that's true. Wanted to see if there was a password strength meter or something comparable. It could be a green check mark and a red X, a word that said strong versus weak. Didn't really matter, just something along those lines. Looked at two-factor authentication, two-step authentication. Uh, then some questions about whether the password was emailed to them, SSL. Uh, restrictions when, when logging in. Mostly what I'm looking at there is, did you create a 20-character password and now you can't use it when you log in? And then, was there some information after you log in that told you about the last time you logged in or, or logging sessions that are open? Then moved on to questions about ways that you could gain access to your account if you forgot your passwords, so security questions, uh, information sent to an email address or text message. Right, so I got some data back from the people who did the unpaid crowdsourcing, and uh, I don't actually have the numbers shown here. If anyone's interested afterwards, I can share that with you. But uh, what I did was try to validate the accuracy of the data, and I did that two different ways. I looked at the control website that was in each spreadsheet that I sent, and looked at the multiple people that got the control website to see if those people answered the questions the same way. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the other 19 records were answered accurately, but I could feel better about the response if three people answered the questions for the same website and all got the same answer versus they all got different answers, I might give a little bit more focus to the responses from those users whose answers didn't match up. So utilizing that technique and doing some random sampling myself of the data that was returned and actually doing the data gathering myself, I determined that there was about a 90% match rate to the data. So I felt pretty good about the data that was returned to me even though probably 8% or so of the data has some inaccuracy, some data that doesn't match. Which doesn't mean the data is bad, it could just be a different interpretation or way the user went about their testing. Who knows what this is? Does anyone want to tell the group what it is? I'm guessing that's the mechanical turf, the chess playing, um, not quite machine. Yeah, there's that very uh, good way of describing it. So the Mechanical Turk was a, and this is just a cross section of it, uh, when it was actually making its appearance, uh, the top cover of it actually had a chessboard on it, and you couldn't see inside of it. And the person who created this led people to believe that it was a machine that could play chess. When in reality, there was a small person inside playing chess, and the lab was involved. So the person inside was a master chess player and could see what was happening on the chessboard above. So Amazon has a service called Amazon Mechanical Turk that's named after the Mechanical Turk. It was launched in 2005, and what it does is it allows people or organization 
that post jobs to Amazon's Mechanical Turk, and then people who want to take on those jobs can respond to them and complete the work. Does anyone utilize Amazon Mechanical Turk as a Turker, a person who actually does the jobs? Okay. Do I see any in there? Okay, one person. Does anyone use it actually to post jobs? No one. Okay. So last year I, I had not used it for either, so I thought the first thing I should probably do is actually complete some jobs. And the kind of jobs that are typical on this website are things like go to uh, the Bank of America branch website or the branch in, on the strip at this address in Las Vegas and collect the information of the phone number and the hours of operation. And it's possible to create scripts that could collect that information and scrape pages and do it. But very economically, you can get people to do that for you. And that's the kind of thing that Amazon Mechanical Turk is good for. It's also good for things like presenting a variety of images to people, let's say four images, and asking them to identify which ones are animals and which ones are humans. Because machines can do that fairly well, but humans can do it better. So those are some examples of the type of work that could be done there. So I thought it might be possible to try to collect research data for the research I wanted to do on this mechanical turf. But first, I, I did some of this. Uh, I, I took on some of these jobs myself. It was mostly visiting websites and answering questions about search engine positioning for keywords and other fairly mundane tasks that did not pay very well. So this work typically pays a few cents to maybe 25 cents per job. So I would not recommend pursuing that as an alternative to whatever you do for a living. But if you like to play games or you like to do crossword puzzles, and you can sit there while you're watching TV and do this and you make a few bucks an hour. And there are people that, in other countries that can earn 10 or more dollars an hour doing this. And, and for them, that could be very lucrative compared to the other alternatives. So here's just an example of what the screen looks like on Mechanical Turk if you did a search for jobs that are available. So uh, one is to do transcription. It's good for transcription because you can break down audio into, say, one minute blocks, assign it to two people, have them trans transcribe the text. If the te text matches up like exactly or for the most part, you pay them. And if it doesn't, you don't. Or you hire three people to do that. Two L3 uh, match. You pay those two, and you don't pay the third. And I don't want to get into the details, but you can tell you can tell Mechanical Turk that people aren't doing a very good job of performing the work, and eventually their their ranking goes down, and uh, that hurts their ability to perform work for other people. So it's actually somewhat difficult to use Mechanical Turk, so I decided to use a different service called Smartsheet.com. Has anyone used that website? It's a collaborative website. Uh, you essentially can think of it in terms of spreadsheets and workflow. Uh, but what I wanted, why I liked it is several years ago they integrated with Mechanical Turk. So you can upload or create a spreadsheet. Uh, you can even do things like add drop down boxes and set what the values are. And then you can grab a number of rows and say, smart, uh, push the smart sourcing button and it will actually integrate it with Mechanical Turk, and it makes it a whole lot easier to send the data to Mechanical Turk, and also to get the data back. Because if you go directly through Mechanical Turk, you really have to work with their APIs, or you get a lot of data that's really hard to process. With uh, Smartsheet, you get the data back in a form that's easy to look at. You can export it as a spreadsheet, you send it as a PDF. You can see the data as it's coming in. You can have it do email notifications send the data to you periodically, it's very easy to work with. So I decided to go that route. The downside is you pay a bit of a commission on top of what the normal rate is for mechanical turning. So, I apologize, this is a little small, but um, what I essentially did is, up top here, I overlaid the spreadsheet version, where these columns are really my questions. Um, on top of it, it's a form that popped up for the smart sourcing that it sends to Mechanical term. I specify the, the fields that I want answered. Um, I specify the field I want automatically populated, which is the site. I made the mistake the first time I did this of not doing that, so it actually sent the jobs mechanical term with a site blank. So if some people fill in a website, they just picked a website 
even though it wasn't one of my top 10,000. So uh, I lost a little bit more money that, that way, so I had to redo it. Fortunately, I only uh, sent like 20 records the first time I did it. Uh, then it lists the questions. I tell them how much I'm willing to pay for each record they respond to. I tell them, in this case, I'm willing to spend 25 cents. Here I tell them how quickly they have to submit the data. In this case, I say 12 hours. I say I only want people that have a 95% or above approval rating. Uh, you can set it as high as 99% and as low as 85%. The trade-off there is people that have a lower approval rating will probably be willing to do the work for a lower compensation, but the data you get back will probably be less garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage, in, garbage out. Uh, and then how long are they going to actually reserve a particular job and I said an hour. So what that means is the work pops up, they say, ooh, I want to grab one of those records. They can essentially lock it for an hour and it's theirs and if they don't submit it back to me within an hour, it goes back into the pool. And then I wanted to leave this entire pool of data out there for a day. I think in this particular case, I put 250 records out there. I took the top 100 websites and then a mix of some websites from uh, further down the rankings. Okay. So here's what the data looks like that I got back. And you can see in this particular case, and I did this a number of times, I put the data out there for around 12 hours, and I think I had 250 records, and something like half of them were processed. Uh, that meant some of them weren't processed, but that's okay because it was easy to sort the data, uh, grab the ones that weren't processed, and just send it back out to the Chemical Turk again. I could also look at the data and flag records and say I don't want to pay the person. The only reason I'd want to do that is if the data was bad and it was worth my time to do that. Generally speaking, I just decided it wasn't worth my time to do that because I decided it was better to have two people looking at the same website and see if the data matched up. And I was feeling pretty altruistic. I decided you know, they, they did the work. They had a 95% rating. If they gave me bad data back, generally it's because it was probably my fault because I worded the questions pretty poorly in some cases and had to modify them later. And I was told by uh, people who worked at Smartsheet that uh, the data I was trying to collect was much, much more complex than what is normally said in the mechanical term. <laughs> so I expected the results were going to be uh, poorer than if I was just asking them to go to the website and tell me that, that whether there's a login screen. Smartsheet also had the capability, and I found this out kind of too late, that I could create a web form, which was better than a spreadsheet because I could just point somebody to the URL of the web form, they could answer all the questions, and then it would get populated back in the same spreadsheet I had or a different spreadsheet, and also email me and tell me they were done. So that would have been a better option for me in hindsight to utilize with my unpaid volunteers instead of sending them dozens of different spreadsheets and then later finding out that uh, numbers on a map doesn't actually process my drop-down list, so the people who receive my spreadsheet use numbers, didn't get drop-down lists, and so they just manually typed in the responses and they didn't match up with the wording that I expected. So the next I decided to validate the accuracy of these results, and I did this a few different ways. I used the same random sampling, sampling method I used for the unpaid volunteers. I also had multiple people looking at each site and looked to see whether they matched. And the result of that was an 84% match rate versus 92%. So the data wasn't quite as good, but it was still pretty good. Of uh, the data I got back, I looked at the tiers and, and blocks of rankings that I shared earlier, and I looked at 100% of the websites. I did those all myself, and I also had Amazon Mechanical Turk process those. And then as we dropped down the rankings, I collected data on less and less of the websites. Didn't really care as much about the bottom 5,000. Eventually, I would love to collect the data for all those. If it seems like it would be of value to people in this room and users and other people out there. Uh, otherwise, I won't. And in terms of the websites, I actually had an account registration feature that was only 59%. My original assumption was that it was going to be somewhere closer to 70%. So, in terms of the findings, I, I started to look at things in a pretty granular format, but for this presentation, I'm just keeping it very high level, and I'll be glad to answer questions we have about more granular data, and also I'll be making this data available uh, within the next couple of weeks. But 
I was looking at it in terms of a few different ways. One, based on the type of website. Was it a financial website, a foreign website, etc.? cetera? Um, looking at it just in terms of the particular controls I was trying to gather data on. And looking at things like the geography of the website. So I started to look at combinations of those attributes, but for this presentation, I'm only displaying it at a very high level. So minimum password length, interestingly, uh, didn't find a single website, and these are hundreds of websites, mind you, that information was gathered for. Not a single website required a password greater than eight characters. I, I was a little bit surprised there weren't a few. Is anyone surprised by that? So I mean, one of the things that me and others have been telling people is to create long passwords and complex passwords and use passphrases. And I found it interesting out of the hundreds of websites that were looked at, none of them actually required a minimum password that was longer than eight characters. And there could be a very good reason for that. These weren't corporate websites, so it's a trade-off, right? If they require someone who uh, creates a password that's 15 or more characters, they're going to have a higher percentage of people that forget their password. They're going to have users that are going to be upset because they don't have to create 15 character passwords on their other big sites. So this doesn't attempt to explain why, it was just an attempt to look at the data itself. Uh, what blew me away was 11% of the websites would accept the one character password. In almost all cases, that was the password one. Really? Yes. Okay. I just must be too dull, but I can't even fathom that. They would let you use one as the password? Correct. <laughs> well, who would think that one would be the password? Yeah. <laughs> who, would, who would try that? And who's seen the movie Spaceballs? <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, and Spaceballs. Maybe it's the username too. I'm sorry. Maybe it's the username too. The username could be one. Yes, that, that's true. That, that's always a possibility. Now, some websites uh, I did attempt for the top hundred to try first names, last names of the users I created, usernames. Some websites caught on to that. Others didn't. Uh, I tried the, the password. Password. I used LeetSpeak. Uh, change the A to an at sign, S is to dollar signs, etc. Then did things like combined words, so I did password passwords. So uh, I, I spent way too much time trying to do those kind of things on websites and kind of went down a rat hole. I spent a lot of time on Google and Facebook, uh, especially on Google trying to do things like lead speak with the word password password and see what it did with the strength meter and get excited when password password was acceptable and so on. Uh, then I decided to abandon that because uh, that really wasn't providing me comprehensive data about the 2,000 websites I really wanted to look at, or what my volunteers would look at. So one thing that uh, I need to look at more closely, and I did this with the top 100, is the way I asked the question of the volunteers, my volunteers that were not on Mechanical Turk did a way better job of this than the ones that were on Mechanical Turk, and one of the trade-offs was the Mechanical Turk, I didn't send them a 5,000 word email to explain in more detail what I was trying to do because I didn't want to scare them off because there's no one on the Council Turk who would have accepted the job or understood what the heck I was asking them to do. But my volunteers who were unpaid, I told them things like, you know, on some websites, it may tell you that the minimum password is five, but it might not really. It might really be three or it might really be seven. So I asked them to actually verify that. So in some cases where it says one, um, the users actually tested that it was one, and in some cases it means the website said one was acceptable. So in my future research, I'm hoping to dig deeper to find out, um, outside of the top 100 websites, where those discrepancies occur. Password composition, only 25% of the websites even had that as a requirement. So complexity, uppercase, lowercase, special characters. Does the login destination page use SSL? I was very explicit uh, with my volunteers what that meant. Because there are many websites that you start with a page that is over a non-SSL connection and enter your username and password, but the destination of that post request is actually utilizing SSL. So 11% of my users didn't know. And some of the reasons that they wouldn't know is a lot of websites now use Ajax. So unless you have a tool that intercepts the traffic between the browser and the website, or utilize something like Firebug, which is an extension for Firefox, and actually tells you what communication is occurring, it can be very difficult to actually know whether the website is utilizing SSL. 
So 53% of the websites that were data was collected for used SSL, SSL for the login, 36% did not, 11% was, it was unknown. And it's been years now we've been telling people that when you build a website for authentication, you need to use SSL. Is anyone surprised about this data? Unfortunately not. So in some cases, I wasn't surprised. that I, I wasn't sure what kind of percentages we were going to see, but knowing the organizations I've been consulting work for and work for internally, a lot of this doesn't surprise me. Now, I do feel pretty good about it. It's only 2% of the websites, and I, I forget how many there were. It was 10 or 20 based on the tool number that were looked at. Actually emailed the user the password in plain text. Um, I don't have the screenshots in here. I ran out of time to put it in, but my wife, uh, who is an analyst with my company, looked at, what was it, Nickelodeon? Nick.com, and the forgotten security, the security question that it had her answer was, was it zip code, the city you live in? The city you live in. And that was utilized for the uh, forgotten password capability. And so she answered the question, and it's trivial probably to find from social media the city my wife lives in. It happens to be the same city I live in. And I may even I actually show that in my presentation. What was really surprising to both of us was that when she answered that question, it returned her password on the website in plain text. So if you have any kids that use Nick.com, their password's in plain text, and the forgotten password capability is the city they live in. So, not a good thing. Does the site yeah, discourage you? Convenient. What's that? I said that's really convenient. It, it is really convenient. So I, I don't get in this presentation into things I recommend people do, but normally when I talk about passwords, I recommend for security questions. The users do not answer them honestly, and they keep track of the answers to those questions. So, uh, with one of my bank accounts, I have an answer to my favorite pet, uh, for my mother's maiden name, I forget which, Donkey Kong Bumper Boat. And uh, it's interesting because they actually verify me by voice and they ask me it, and I tell them that's my answer. And they say, no, that's not right. I'm like, put it in your system. And I go, oh, yeah, I guess that is your mother's maiden name, so. <laughs> So very few, very few websites discourage people from using the same password they use somewhere else, 4%. Uh, in terms of websites that educate users on how to create a strong password, I would have thought that a higher percentage would at least have some text to explain, here's how one goes about creating a strong password. Even if it was text that said, the way you go about doing it is you pick your last word, your social security number. Even if it wasn't good advice, I was expecting them to have some advice about how to create it other than here's the minimum length, maximum length, and character composition that is permitted. This two-factor authentication or two-step authentication option, it was for only 5% of websites. That really didn't surprise me because I would expect to find that more frequently in corporate websites on things like VPNs or financial websites. Most of the financial websites weren't actually looked at because most of my volunteers um, we're not assigned financial websites that they actually had access to. I believe they all probably had access to financial websites, but I didn't ask them to identify the websites that they do their banking at and to submit information on those. I might have assigned them city.com or bankofamerica.com and they didn't actually have accounts on those. So, there was a movie called Group Force, and I, I, I wasn't aware of that, but I was looking for an image on Group Force, so here we go. It was from the 40s, I have no clue I've seen it, but I'm definitely going to watch it next week. <laughs> One of the websites that was in the top 200, and I haven't told them about this yet, so I'm not going to share the website name. One of the websites in the top 200 only allowed me, it's an e-commerce website, it only allowed me to create a password consisting of a four-digit pin, so I decided it might be interesting to enumerate all the four-digit pins, and that took very little time to do. And my hypothesis now is that I can brute force attack again access to anybody's account that uses its e-commerce website as long as I know their email address. Also found out I could change their credit card numbers too, but I haven't figured out whether that's actually a bad thing or not. Um, it's bad because if they try to order something. They probably won't be able to order it, but there's not a way that a black hat, I believe, could benefit from that vulnerability. But 
I'll probably let them know about that issue as well. So if you remember at the beginning, there were two things I was seeking to do, or find out whether sites are doing a good job protecting user accounts. In a nutshell, no. I can't tell you at this point whether certain types of websites are or aren't. I need to do some more analysis to figure that out. I have the data. It's just a matter of continuing to crunch it. So the kinds of things I'm going to be looking at are by the industry of the website, the geographic location, uh, whether websites that are ranked more highly than lower ranked websites perform better or worse in terms of their controls, whether uh, the fact that they've had one or more data breaches involving their passwords makes a difference. And I also look or wanted to look at whether security conscious users could create strong passwords and in some cases or could control access to their accounts better than others. In some cases, yes, in some cases, no. There were a lot of websites that didn't utilize SSL, would not let me create a long, complex password, um, and then didn't do much to protect my session ID and my cookies. So I'm basically taking a gamble whenever I use a website like that. Some of the lessons I learned are, probably the most important takeaway from this is to do a lot of work up front and use an iterative approach because I was really eager to start collecting the data once I identified attributes, but then I realized I wasted my time because the attributes I collected weren't the right attributes and the way I was collecting them didn't make as much sense as other ways I could collect them. So um, if I was to do this again, I'm definitely continuing to research, but if I was to do it again, I would start with a subset of the attributes, get some volunteers involved, have them do some work, talk with them about the results that were retrieve, look to see if those attributes need to be modified, and then figure out, based on layman, better ways to work the questions. So then I conducted a, a research study like this involving non-technical people, I'd be more likely to get them to respond and provide better data. And then not all spreadsheet applications behave as expected. I was using OpenOffice and Excel, but other applications uh, users had tremendous problems with. Here are some of the people that helped me uh, doing this research. Some people didn't want their names mentioned. These people did. So kudos to these people. And that's a picture of my wife. She uh, did a tremendous amount of work on this project. Now, I have a few questions for you, and I think we have probably five minutes left. What I want to know from you is, would this data benefit you if I posted this to web, the web or made it available, especially if I continue to do my research? Yes. 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 Okay. So I'm going to go about doing that. Um, we can talk afterwards about the best way to do that. And one of the things I want to know, we're running out of time and want you to be able to ask questions, but I just want to raise questions up for you. These are things I would like to know from you. Want to know what else? I could potentially collect that might benefit you, and I want to talk about how it could benefit you. Then I have two other questions that you might not be able to answer now, but these are really the big questions, and this is going to determine what direction I take with this research is whether this data can help people make better decisions. What I'm thinking here is users that choose a bank probably look at things like fees and where the bank ranges are. I doubt they're looking at the controls to protect the money in their account. And I don't think there's anything out there, that, there's nothing I've seen that says, show me the top 10 banks and what the controls are, put them side by side in the grid so I can take that account. I'm not expecting most users would choose their bank based on that, but I think it may be nice for them to have. So I'm wondering if that kind of data would benefit a regular user. I'm not talking about people that are doing password research and are very enthusiastic about passwords and security. Then I'm also interested in whether that data might be beneficial in terms of influencing websites' decisions. Very much so, yes. Look, I have absolutely no doubt it will be very useful, especially on, on lots of Public shaming. So public shaming is one of the things that, that I have in mind, and, and I'm thinking there's some directions we can take with that. Once this data is all out there, I believe it would be easy for me and other people to reach out to organizations and say, I'm not comfortable with this. These other websites that are like what you provide are doing a better job. Are you willing and interested in doing that? If you have a banking website, website and you sort by sucking and you send them email saying, hey, we're going to release this in 30 days, we thought you might want to know you're in the top 10. So, so to talk about, about sucking here's my next step. So I'm going to move through that. I think I only have one more slide. 
maybe I missed it. Uh, it's under my next step scoring system. So I mentioned earlier I had these six or seven different categories of attributes. And I started to work with a scoring system. I don't know what the algorithm is going to be, but I thought it would be interesting, at least qualitatively, maybe quantitatively, to be able to save for a website for password strength. Do you do good or you do bad? For breach and vulnerability history, you have a lot of breaches. Um, to look at things that, in that kind of detail. So those are some of the things that I have in mind. So if you have any questions, I, I think we maybe have about a minute and a half left, a few, two minutes, give you a chance. Here's the top, uh, places I'm going to be in for the, between now and Monday morning. So if you want to reach me this week, let's talk. If you want to reach me after this week, here's some ways to get a hold of me. So any questions now, comments? What bank do you use? <laughs> <laughs> I have like six or seven bank accounts. One of them is Bank of America. I'm not happy with uh, the security control of my banks. Yes? Have you reached out as, as yourself saying, well, I've just done this research and I don't like, well, you know, this site's you visit personally. Have you actually tried reaching out to them? I, I have not yet. Um, I felt like it might be more impactful after I have the website I'm recreating. After I get more feedback over the course of this week, it seems like everyone is running, a lot of people are running enthusiastic, so I suspect I'll be doing that fairly soon. I felt like it might be more impactful if I could point them to the website when I talk to them and say, look, if you want to see how your peers are doing, look here. But in my experience, when I contact organizations, even when I know the people at security, um, it doesn't always make a lot of difference. Right. Round of applause for Steve.